Welcome back to the Tapes Archive podcast, where we release interviews that have never been heard before. Please listen to episode 000, an introduction for the full backstory about this podcast series. On this episode, we have Blind Melon frontman Shannon Hoon. At the time of this interview in 1995, Hoon was 28 years old and out on tour promoting his band's new album, Soup. In the interview, Shannon talks in depth about the making of the band's latest record, what it was like performing at Woodstock 94, his years playing high school sports in Indiana, and what was then his newest experience, being a father to his baby girl, Nico Blue. Unfortunately, about a month after this interview, Shannon Hoon was found dead after an apparent drug overdose. As always, we have music critic Mark Allen at the helm conducting the interview. Before we get to the interview, we have a couple of housekeeping items. If you would like to support the show, please go over to the website at thetapesarchive.com and click on the support button. On there, you'll find many ways to show your support for the show, and all of them are free. While on the website, check out Mark's blog for more context of this interview and for some personal insight from Mark himself. One last thing, the Tapes Archive podcast is a proud member of the Osiris Podcast Network, a global community connecting passionate fans with podcasts and experiences about artists and topics you love. Thanks for tuning in, and now it's time to open the vault. Then, uh, being in America, uh, and, and where are you now? I'm in Toronto. Oh, okay. For some reason, I thought you were in New York. So. No. It, it almost gets so frustrating that by the time you do get called, you don't want to fucking talk to anybody. <laughs> well, uh, you got through. You're not very late. That's uh, that's great. Um, anyway, uh, well, I want to talk to you some about the, the new record and such, and uh, then about your, uh, your, your youth here in Indiana. So, okay. Uh, let's talk about the new record first. Uh, how frustrating is it to, to know that you've made a better, more interesting interesting follow-up record and, and it's going to be much more difficult to get people to hear it i think that that's something we were aware of when we when we went in to make the record um i think the one thing that roger stated about the first record which was which rang so true is is, is a is a good uh, a, a good progressive growth with the band he, he was you know he he talks about you know the first record being the musical, you know, it was the musical placenta. It was basically the first song that we, had, the first songs that we had ever written and recorded together. Um, and I think that, I think that since then, we have managed to hone in on making more of a record this time around, opposed to like a record with a few singles on it. I, I personally you know, like this new record a lot more than I do the first. I think the first record was a good reflection of where we were at the time we made it. But I think that this record has more of a more of a, a mixed up styles, which is more of the way we like it. I mean, we realize that that financially and 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 as far as eliminating a lot of the housewives who probably bought the first record for no rain, we realize that. Uh, but I think that I think that everybody wants to stay as honest as they can about um, about the songs that we write and and keep that not keep. The, uh, the hit single thing as 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 the not as the focus, you know. Um, so no rain two was not an option. Is that no what you're rain saying? two wasn't an option unless it subliminally came through in a in a different form on this one. I mean, we. we uh, I just I like the fact that you sit down and each song has an even you know there's there's no obvious singles on the record that was the first thing that that um, you know we noticed when we when we sat down and we deciphered which songs were going to be on on the record and which ones weren't and I think that it, you know after you get done with the sequencing and you get done putting it and taping it all together um, that was one of the first things that I had noticed. And, I think that uh, I think that it's it's a lot better to have a record. I think that's the point of making a record. Otherwise, you just release forty fives all your life. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. But um, it, it just seems like uh, like you guys are in with a whole bunch of other people in that you you get you know you, your first record did incredibly well, and then by the time audiences seem to like burn it up, and then they just go on to something else. It's like by the time the second record comes out, they're on to something else. Do you, do you have any any sense of that? And, and do you have any oh, feeling of why? Of course I do. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's just obvious it's human nature these days. You know, that there's a rapid pace going on. Uh, things are things are quickly uh, chewed up and spit out more so today than they were five, ten years ago. 
And I think that um, I think that if people are not going to listen much to something that they might have to listen to a couple times. You know, if it does, you know, I read a lot. Uh, of uh, of things that are actually quite humorous because you know you see you see you know some of the critics they instead of falling over their tongue they quickly like they quickly uh, state the album is, is a piece of shit and it, it and to me it it kind of just it's it's obvious that the person that doesn't have the patience to really sit down and listen to anything more than one time it's like it's that whole Boris uh, don't Boris get us to the chorus type of mentality. <laughs> You know, so I mean, t- to me, I uh, I was always a fan of records that you that you had to kind of sit and soak with them for a little while. You know, I always like that about Pink Floyd records. You know, you could never really figure out why you liked it, but you always, for a certain kind of mood, you would always put that one of those records on, like the Soft Full of Secrets. There was always like this mood that maybe only came around like once or twice a week, but it was the kind of mood that ended up being like three or four times a week, and then it was, next thing you knew, the thing was permanently locked into your CD players. Mm. I, I just, um, yeah, I, I, we were definitely aware of that, though. I mean, there's, we're in, a, you know, I'm in a band where, fortunately enough, there's there's five songwriters, um, so there's never one guy writing all the stuff, so it's never monotonous. And sometimes people just want, uh, you know, some people like to hear bands that repetitively play the same songs basically over and over, just with different words. And I think that um, I think that we're a little bit different than that. Yeah, um, but. Um, but and then you go into it, and you know that that you know exactly what people are waiting for. They are waiting for no rain too, and and uh, you know that's that's just got to be horrible as an artist. To try it, to it actually it, it isn't as horrible if you recognize it. If you know that prior to doing it, I mean everybody is always like they pull the B girl out of the trump card. Right? <laughs> oh, there's no B girls on this record. It's like to me that's a, that's a compliment. Right. It's like I, I don't I don't want to live my whole life through one album by any means so I think that uh, I think that uh, you know all I could really ask and I think that everybody in the band will agree the only thing that you can really ask yourself is, is to try to musically move forward you can't really judge this, the the satisfaction of a record based upon how many it sells yeah. I mean all I can do is ask that our playing gets better that our writing seems to get better and that we feel like we've progressed and, and I feel like we did that I feel like we really sampled out a lot of a lot of musical styles that we all were interested in um, that maybe we didn't feel like waiting to to the third or fourth record to get to we felt like just getting started with it now and if you and if you do that you do do it at the risk of losing a lot of people but I think that anybody who really really likes the band um, realizes and if they've ever seen us they know that we're into I mean we like to change it's like it's a, I don't like to to stay in the same aura of music for too long I like to kind of jump around and, and sample everything on the table and then come back and, and reflect on it and I think that everybody took the chance of of um of branching out into different styles of music when we when we decided to write the record and we decided to bring in a lot of like different styles that we weren't used to working with and working with and um uh, you know like to me i think that you know it's like the beastie boys thing, you know the beastie boys first record was phenomenal and um their second record paul's boutique was was not so, not so happily embraced by everybody but you know what it was one of their best records and i mean i, I just I, i'm enjoying myself i'm enjoying where we just started uh touring we just got back from europe touring and and uh, i'm enjoying playing these songs they're you know they're they're fun to play live and it's just fun to play other songs you know we've been playing the same songs night after night for two years yeah (laughs) you want to take people through a a quick guided tour of this record what should they look for and what uh you know and and explain things that might throw them for a loop yeah we um we ended up we recorded it in new orleans which um i don't know if you've ever spent any time there it's I can't say I have. No. It's uh, it's a city that uh, one's willpower is tested in. That's for sure. <laughs> and the metabolism usually doesn't prevail. But um, it, we recorded it with Andy Wallace. We recorded it in, in, like I said, New Orleans at the studio called Kingsway. It's right in the middle of the French, or right on the back side of the French Quarter. Uh, so there's never uh, lag in anything to anything for anything to do. Um, we. Uh, we we waited for a long time from after the first record to record this one because we weren't so 
we weren't so apt to wanting to jump on the hype of the first record and quickly release a second record. Um, we kind of wanted to let the no rain thing go away, and we kind of wanted to just go away. We just wanted people to just kind of forget about it. We uh, stayed down there for about three months. We brought in um, we brought in um, a brass band, Kermit Ruffins, who's like the high flying horn player in New Orleans. Uh, we brought in him and the Little Rascals brass band to add like a, some local flavor to it. And then uh, we uh, got done probably about three months ago. It took, it took us about three months to make the record. We weren't any, we didn't really jump. I mean, to spend time in New Orleans, we knew that it was going to have an effect on the record. So we just kind of stayed down there for a while. And, and, and a lot of the things were written uh, before we went down there, but they were never they were never like polished and finished off. They were just kind of ideas when we went down there. We kind of wanted to wait till we all had gotten together to finish them all up. So, and we wanted to do that in New Orleans okay. because we knew that that would have an effect on us as well, and you know, and it an effect on the music. The songs were almost recorded in the order that they were on the record. They, um, the song Car Seat was a song that's about the uh, Susan Smith from the, that whole thing. Right. The song, let's see, well, here I am, here I am forgetting what the songs are on the record. You know, I never really, I never really think about what the, what, about this part of it. I, I'm the most unpolished off interview guy that you'll ever meet. That's okay. I, um, <laughs> I like sometimes that. I just, I don't know, I don't like kind of overanalyze it a, a whole lot, so therefore, unfortunately, I forget a lot. The song Galaxy was, um, it's written about a 64 Galaxy that I bought while I was down there. Uh, the song Vernie is about my grandmother, and uh, the song Wilt is about, uh, it's a combination of a, of a bus driver that we had one time who had the worst breath I think that anybody could ever possibly have. <laughs> So, uh, Tell me about Toes Across the Floor. I, the that's song really Toes my Across the Floor is a collage of, um, it kind of is a is an extension of the song Skinned in a sense. The song Skinned is about the serial killer, Ed Gein. <laughs> um, this guy used to build uh, furniture out of people's bones. Uh, he was the far, he's the guy who they did sort of a spin off of Silence of the Lambs. All right, okay. Come on. And um, you should, you know what, actually, you should relay that message to uh, the lady who reviewed the record and, and said that I soured it. I got, my mother sent me this review, <laughs> said that the tune sours blind melon soup. You know, you should tell her to find out what the meanings of some of these songs are before she puts her <laughs> mentality on the chopping block. Okay. So tell her that when she slams a song like uh, Car Seat, that she needs to realize she's slamming a very touching story that I'm sure that a lot of people are affected by. Okay. Well, she's working in Cleveland now, but I'll definitely oh, relay she? the message. Yeah, yeah. 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 make sure to tell her I'll. She'll definitely get some. She, you know, she does, she's the kind of person who seems like she'd be the first one to call for like free passes to the show. Like, <laughs> you always get those people. It's really funny because we keep all these bad reviews, you know. And it's all right if someone legitimately slams you, but when they have no clue, and you can tell that they just didn't really even take the chance of finding anything out before they decided to post their opinion on it, it, it cracks me up because usually those are the first people who will call and ask if they can get them and four of their friends into the show. Yeah. No, they I always say, yeah, yeah, and by the time they go through all the parking problems and everything, and then they get up to the ticket counter, and then they wait through line, and they ask for their tickets, you give them their envelope, they get their envelope, and it has the clipping in it. <laughs> and that's always a fun thing. No, it's interesting because I um, I gave uh, you know I try to assign those reviews based on the uh, you know some give it to somebody I think would be sympathetic or at least likes the style of music and and you know I did not uh, I gave her the only copy I got and I got a copy a couple of weeks later um, right after the review ran and uh, and I thought it was I think this is a way more interesting record I mean no offense to the first record but I thought that was a pretty much a one note record and and uh, this one I like all the styles and I think you take a lot of chances and it's different from some song to song, which is what I always listen to a record for. So. I was a big fan of the Velvet Underground, and I think that was what I liked the most about the Velvet Underground, yeah. is that you had Lou Reed, you know, who could, who could, who, you know, who could really, really write words, and then every, and then, I, you know, all the other people in the band were into, like, different kinds of music. You had John Cale, who was, like, a complete master of, of instruments, and and then, like, each song would just, you know, there would be a common thread, but you couldn't put your finger on it. There would be a common thread that would entwine all the songs, but you could never put your finger on what it was. 
I think that I mean the song Lemonade is probably the most bombastic song that to, that is a rep, you know is, is full on characteristic of New Orleans. It's just it, you know it um, was the song that Kermit and the band played on, which um, which was a definite highlight as far as the days in the studio when those guys came in. It was Kermit brought in like it was like four other people, and they were a band that plays out on the street in New Orleans. Man, they were. Phenomenal, man, and and they and they were the embodiment of New Orleans. Every characteristic of the city came through in them, just as people who, well, while they were talking in between takes, so they were so authentic, man. It was like it was it was a pretty funny day, and man, they could drink. Oh my god, <laughs> I, I was waiting for just like bubbles to start coming out of their horns because they were. It was really really funny. I think we enjoyed ourselves more this time making a record because we had done it before, and I think on the first record, you know, and, and no, I don't take offense to it because I also believe that it was it was our first record, and I believe that you know you're you're very apprehensive about feeling comfortable when you go into a studio and you have the, all this money that's pumped into making a record when we're when you're used to doing recordings for like you know a fraction of the cost that it takes, and you realize all the seriousness that surrounds it. I think it took a long time for us to relax and, and kind of feel comfortable about saying no. We don't want to spend that much money on something. You know, we would rather we would rather wait rather than jump on the hype of the band and wait till we're relaxed and, and feel like making another record. You know, so there was, I think that a lot of the elements surrounding the record are what makes me like the record yeah. more. Not opposed, sometimes, like, just listening to it, uh, yeah, I can like it, but I think about, there's a lot of things that are that are surrounding the record that are... that lay very well with me. And that was the manner that we took about recording it, the manner we took as far as realizing the meshing of of what we do together each one of us as individuals because we're very different people and if you were ever in a room with all five of us you would you would definitely notice it so to try to find a common denominator and 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 something to to uh to uh grow on equally it's it's sometimes it's difficult you know we there is tension in the band and, and because everybody knows how to to write a song but i think the common denominator is that everybody wants to make the, the song as best as it can be yeah. and if there's only going to be one common denominator thank god that that's the one how um how, how did all this feeling about uh, let's go away for a while let's not cr recreate no rain how did that sit with the record company oh obviously not well i mean <laughs> But at the same time, um, I think that some people's plans are a lot bigger for us than maybe what we want them to be. I can't, I can't, if it's, if it's because of enthusiasm, well, then I'm not going to say anything. But if it's just for the almighty dollar bill, I have to sit and go, well, you know what, the, you, you start fooling with the longevity of things. You know, I mean, after the last record, or after the first record, and, and here, you know, you're talking about guys who had never really been on tour, and then all of a sudden we got thrust into a two-year tour. Uh, our domestic lives had completely crumbled. And I think that there was, there was a lot of foundations that had, had weakened, and we needed to strengthen them before this could be an honest record. And I think that that's one thing that everybody really, really uh, agreed on quite quickly was that we did want to take some time off, and we did want to, you know, repair what had been damaged um, by the unexpected success of the first record. And I think it, I think it probably it did. I mean, here you start to dislike something you love to do. There's got to be something going wrong somewhere. And I think it was because we were just being, we were. Uh, catering to the success of a single. You want to do it because people want to see you play a lot, and you want to play, but sometimes you really have to sit back and evaluate if it's if it's affecting you personally or not, because you insult people when you get up there and you don't want to be there and you think that they don't see it. I mean, I notice it when I go to see a band if they don't want to be there, and I, and I think that that um that that's the way the last six months of our tour was because I think that they, and you know the, those nights a lot of them the crowd complete their enthusiasm completely carries you sometimes that's where you realize the power of having having a, a following because they sometimes are the only saving grace of of touring 
because it, it, it isn't that it isn't all cracked up to what everybody thinks it is it's fun for about like the first couple of months and then you start to realize that you're so sheltered away from like reality you have to quickly remind yourself that this is sort of similar to a carnival mm-hmm. you know or the 4-H fair <laughs> it kind of runs along the same lines of it and you just want to see a familiar face every now and then and sometimes that familiar face comes from someone you've never met before who knows all the words to your song or, or something like that so I think that um yeah to answer your question in a very long way the the record label they weren't they probably weren't happy that we didn't want to record right away but at the same time they're not pushy and i'm not you know i think record companies yes i think they make way too much money off the artists who who create the records but i think that uh you know i've managed to i'm not mr anti-record company you know if it's it's your fault if you don't look at everything clearly before you sign on the dotted line so i'm not going to sit here and in hindsight say it's someone else's fault but i'm happy i'm happy with what um with the record and what we're doing now and and uh, the pace that we're doing it at we're still doing like a small a small kind of tours you know we we did a couple we just went over and we did Europe with Soundgarden and and it was it was it was enjoyable because we know those guys and 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 the shows were really big but but I think that um yeah I think we're more comfortable in a more of an intimate environment I think for us we come off better okay. um, well yeah you're gonna play like a fifteen hundred capacity place so. yeah and I think so. that that's where we're most comfortable at doing it I think it, anything else because that 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 Anything bigger than that, the element of, of laptop computers starts to come around too much. <laughs> Everything gets too serious when the shows are, like, bigger than that. So what was it like being on stage at Woodstock? It was interesting. I think that by no means did it even come close to capturing what the first one was all about. Uh, I think it was a real real weak attempt at it, but I, don't, I didn't see anybody there who really didn't have fun. And I think that's what made it... You know, the, the only things that really made it a, where you heard the remnants of the first Woodstock was when you saw, you know, we went on after Joe Cocker. And to see Joe Cocker sing Feeling All Right was something that just blew me away. I was like, oh, my God, not only am I, like, blown away by this, but I, we have to play it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like I, I met Peter Max there, and, and that was someone who I always wanted to meet. And I asked the guy to, to sign my guitar, uh-huh. and Peter Max turned my guitar, my acoustic guitar over, and drew a whole picture on the back of it. Cool. And I was <laughs> like, wow, if this rock and roll thing doesn't work out, this will pay the rent for a while. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right and um, okay well um, let me let me ask you about uh, growing up here you, you said your mom uh, sent you the clip so she's obviously still living here did you grow up in Lafayette yeah or, I grew okay, up in Lafayette, Lafayette. Okay. I actually just uh, I bought a house there I live there still you do yeah. oh okay oh my god I and my uh, my girlfriend who I met um, in Laf- we grew up in Lafayette uh-huh. uh, we went to McCutcheon High School we we um we just had our first child about eight weeks ago. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, That's great. So Boy or girl? That little girl. All right. Yeah, we were, and I had to leave like a week and a half later, so it's it's taken, it's it's hard to say. I, I would be lying if I said I was 100% enthusiastic about being out on tour right yeah. now. Because I just, you know, I'm like, it's just hard to be away. Well, you got you got four more weeks of uh, a crying, uh, shitting, uh, pissing. Uh, well, you know, I thought, this, I thought that this messed a man's sleep up for a living. Doing yeah. this for a living, I thought you lost a lot of sleep. Man, it ain't nothing compared to parenthood. That's true. But but you want to be there at three months, because three months you start getting smiles and things like you that. You know what? That's what's going on right Like, she's starting to smile right now. She's found her smile as far as, like, honestly and sincerely using it at times when she wants to smile. Oh, that's what you're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, obviously, you're, you're a father. Uh, my, well, I have a, a little girl who's going to turn four, and i uh, got another one uh, who's due November 4th. So, oh, wow. Yeah, Congratulations so, to right. you, too. Yeah, so it's it's very cool. But when you start seeing the things and the little things that they do, yeah, it's going to suck for you to be on the road. And well, you know what I'm stuff. doing is I I'm, I'm think I'm buying a uh, a mobile home mm-hmm. to... Um, to take out on the road uh, me and Lisa we like to camp and everything as well and since the baby now is 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 healthy enough to be able you know we've checked with the doctors they said it was okay that we could take her out so I think that we're going to do like a lot of uh, touring with her oh good, good. but yeah I, I grew up in Lafayette 
um, went to school there and uh, just moved back there from Chicago. Yeah. Now, um, Dave Banger, the critic at the yeah. Lafayette paper, he was he told me that um, a, a while back. He said, you know, nobody knew about Axl Rose really, but everybody knew you, and that that, that you were very vocal, and that you you know that that um, you, you made no you made it plain to anybody who would listen that you were going to be a star. Is it, <laughs> I that, said that. Is that accurate? Or? I think that's very. Uh, Inaccurate. Oh, okay. I, that's. Uh, I'll have to ask him again because that's what I thought he said. But let me. Uh, uh, I'll double check on that. Anyway, Dave, so, Dave's a Dave's a really nice guy. Yeah, though. he is a good he, guy. He really is. He's. He was. You know. I mean. It's, 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 sometimes it's hard to, it's not hard to talk to a local paper, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, th that is where all my friends are. Yeah. And I feel kind of funny because I like, I like being at home because my friends still tell me to fuck off, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and you know, isn't it, isn't it wild how you come to miss that? Yeah. <laughs> So, so I, I, I like, I, you know, I still, uh, you know, actually there's a, do you know Mike Kelsey? Uh, yeah, sure. I yeah, Mike's with us him. right now. Mike's oh. here with us in Toronto. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, Mike actually played, there's a hidden track on the, on the record. Mm -hmm. And I, and I wanted, you know, me and Mike played in our first, in the first band we were ever in together. And, um, okay. and we went to high school together and, uh. And I brought Mike down to New Orleans because I wanted our producer Andy to see Mike's new age way of music. Now you know where, I don't know if you've seen Mike play. I've seen his video. He sent me a yeah, video where he does the acoustic uh, percussion off of the guitar and everything. Yeah, yeah we that's the exact video that our producer seen and wanted to see Mike. Mm -hmm. So Mike came down to New Orleans and um, and we ended up. I wanted to re I wanted Andy to record it because we had a lot of extra tape and we had extra time and I was like you know I want I want Mike to just we well, this place we recorded was a three story it was like this three story mansion it was really killer and um, Mike went up in the top it was really old so Mike goes up in the top and we set up just a mic right in the hallway because the echo in the hallway was great and it was sort of you didn't have to create it through a bunch of technology it was original just authentic sounds that he was getting and. Um, he played for like an hour straight, and we recorded all of it. And what we did was we, we took the best parts of it, and we kind of just made this swirl of like weird music. And like the, everybody picked an instrument they didn't know how to play, and it was all based around what Mike had played. And then we took the, the song New Life on the record, which is about... Uh, you know, our child, my child, uh, Lisa, telling me she was she was pregnant. Um, it was a song that we we put on the record, and we took the vocals track from that, and we played it backwards over what Mike had done, and it's the hidden track on the record. And the only way to get to it, which I'm telling you, don't have to put this in the interview. I've actually, I'm just telling you personally because okay. you know Mike and I. Right. Um, you have to lay on the scan button. I believe, and it, it'll scan back through it at the beginning of the record. You'll have to scan all the way through it, and when you'll hear it go, blah, 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 and then when it stops, you, you know, then let off the scan button, and it'll start. Oh, okay. But it's really, anyway, Mike's, yeah, Mike's here with us now. Oh, that's cool. He's yeah. going to play with us at this, uh, we're going to take him on tour, and he's going to play his little thing between the first band and us. Great. And that's um, wonderful. Yeah. He's up here playing this, uh, we're doing this, it's the MTV of Canada. Uh -huh. We're doing like their unplugged thing. <laughs> and uh, oh, these things are such a pain in the butt. But they're, they're fun to do, but setting them up, you have to go in and, and just do all this, the, 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 the crap that goes around setting it up is sometimes a real pain in the ass. Yeah. But Mike's playing on it with us. So what, what was the band that you and Mike were in together? That we were time? in a couple of, we were in a couple that no, didn't even have names, and then we were, we were in a band called Stiff Kitten. Okay. Yeah. And then um, then we ended up figuring out that we really did like doing this. So and we it was like this cheesy cover tune band that we were in, and we used to uh, just get our kicks out of doing that. And then it was like we realized it. You know, you grow out of that whole '80s rock thing, and you think, wow, you know, I really enjoy the therapeutic value of writing songs. So we started just we did we just kind of stayed and wrote songs together. We didn't really have a band, and then um, we just started to get into different kinds of music and stuff like that. And, and uh, I ended up, I just uh, for, I had to leave off the end. I just was kind of uh, I got tired of. I, I wanted to go. I like to write, mm -hmm. so I like I wanted to go on a vacation, and I, and I think my vacation is still going on. <laughs> So where did you go? I, mean, I ended up moving to Los Angeles okay. in like 1989. All right. And um, I always kept in touch with Mike and I and and all that. And, and I got I really kind of went out, and I wasn't really looking for a band. Was the thing is when I moved out to Los Angeles, I was kind of just 
kept wanting to see it. And I was wanting to, you know, climb into writing. And I wanted to climb into, like, writing about, like, just traveling around. And, and you know, I was a victim of, um, of a lot of small town mentality as far as, like, the racist prejudice state of mind that inhabits a lot of small you know, small town, and I was, uh, you know, I needed to see why I didn't want to be that way, and I, you know, I was, I think that my point of view was very, very narrow, and I needed to broaden my horizons, and I needed to seek myself into a community that had, like, a little bit of culture, and a little bit of, um, I went from, you know, when I was in high school, I was, I was a very, very small-minded kid as far as, like, anybody whose lifestyle was, you know, whether you be gay or whatever, I, I didn't agree with it, and I, but I never really found out why. And when I moved out to L.A., I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't as prejudiced as what I thought I was. You know, I was able to embrace a lot of people. You know, I didn't have to, to agree with it as far as, like, my personal choice. But, it, but that didn't mean I couldn't understand it. And it was, it was something that, as far as, a, as me as a human being, I felt helped me grow more than anything, was moving to Los Angeles and having so many different... Uh, colors and ra- uh, creeds on my block more so than I had ever uh, had ever come in contact with. You know, my from my roommate to to the people next door, I had like Asians, blacks, gays, uh, everything surrounding me, and and I think that uh, finding finding the ability to adapt to to uh, to all that helped me out you know as, as far as like helping me grow up a bit mm-hmm. and uh, so it's kind of funny in a way that you're back and, uh, yeah I mean I think I, I think everybody kind of I, I don't know I'm speaking obviously for me but I think that um, that uh, the best thing for me was to to move away and, and once I stepped out of sight of, of of my home uh, I was able to deal with home a little better, and I, and you know I can I I love the fact that I can that I can you know still feel comfortable in my hometown and there's not a you know there's not a lot of people that bug me and that um, as far as like coming and, and ringing my door at three in the morning you know I don't, I don't have <laughs> a lot of people still don't give a shit about what I'm doing and, and I like that. <laughs> now, so so uh, this this thing that I was saying that Dave said that maybe I've got completely wrong, but so this is not right at all. I mean, you were just uh, quietly going along and playing in bands. Well, I wasn't the... quietly ever. Okay. <laughs> I don't think quiet ever really fit part and parcel with me at all. But I think I, I mean, I always just I always suffered from wanting being somewhere and wanting to be somewhere else. I mm-hmm. think. Sometimes that can be mistaken as what you're saying. Yeah. You know, I, I just, I, I, I was never satisfied, but sometimes it wasn't, that wasn't a bad thing for me. I've learned to deal with it. Uh, well, I struggle with it, but, I, but I've, I found a way to kind of ease the anxiety a bit. But I mean, I just, I always just want to, I want to do more. I mean, I'm never satisfied with what I've done. I want to do more. And, and I was, you know, I was an athlete through all through high school. And um, as far as being a star athlete, that was something that maybe I, a lot of people, you know, because a lot of people knew me from Lafayette. They never knew the, my musical background at all, opposed to my athletic background. You know, I pole vaulted, I played football, and I wrestled, and, and um and uh, you know, I did all right in each one, and, and um, it was funny because I was looking at old Journal and Courier clippings of me pole vaulting and things like that. It's really just, it's really funny because I still have that hunger inside of me that was just like, man, I can remember that. You know, the competitive air that surrounded that. I loved it, and uh, and it was like, uh, you know, I, I was never satisfied with with the second place. You know, and uh, you know, unfortunately, that that ended up being the. Uh, a very actually turned out to be a very frustrating. I couldn't enjoy a game of pinball without wanting to beat my opponent to the point where it wasn't a recreational game of pinball. Yeah. I think I just wanted to get the most out of life. I think that anything that entails traveling and, and meeting different people and, and different cultures and things like that, that's what I enjoy about going to Europe and, and thing, you know, going, taking trips to third world countries where you go, wow, maybe I don't, maybe I take a lot for granted. You realize, I realized that about what I took for granted when I lived in Lafayette. And now, now I've moved back home, so I'm just kind of applying what I've seen and learned, trying to you know, build a quiet home life. Cool. Yeah, that's great. And um, I guess you, you had the uh, your earlier moments of uh, of rock stardom and getting in uh, trouble and making.
making headlines with the various incidents, but you've been pretty quiet the last year or so. And, uh, I uh, think a kid does that to you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, I... There's a lot less time to go out. Yeah, go I mean, there's a reason. Someone told me there's a reason why now. And I, and I looked at him and I said, you know what? For me, there's a reason why not. <laughs> now there's a reason why not to do something. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that... Uh, I mean, I just... I look at... Uh, I look at the big picture, I think, a little bit more now, opposed to the, the, the small one. And this, you know, I'm enjoying what we're doing. And, and at this point in time, um, I would like to have, to think that I have the energy to do it for a long time. But I know that I know that there's a bigger picture, and I think that this is just a small part of it. Um, so I'm just kind of enjoying it now. And um, and uh, but you know, obviously, the world is is revolving around around. My, my daughter and um, and I think that uh, Lisa and I are trying to build a very good home for her and, and I don't think that having me be in jail somewhere is the appropriate way to go yeah <laughs> yeah funny how that works out. Yeah. <laughs> And I was, man, some of my friends called me and they said, Shannon, you know, did you hear what Bob and Tom said about your child? And I'm like thinking, you know, I don't care what anybody says about me, but don't start, don't take it as, you know, my daughter was like a week, not even a week old, you know, and, and they, um, they were calling her Who Blew Hoon. <laughs> The air. How nice. Is that horrible? Their element of humor is about the only thing that, um, keeps keeps I don't know. I, I I don't really know. All I know is that I just could never understand why they go this is Bob and Tom and this is Journey on Q ninety this was such a contrast. <laughs> uh, but maybe you know what? Maybe it's part of the humor. Well, I don't think so. I think they're I think they are trying to be so mainstream that, you know, because they say, well, we've got, uh, you know, the WFMS listener, you know, who's going to listen to Bob and Tom, and you don't want to play a song that'll turn them off, and you don't want to yeah. play a song that'll turn the, the easy listening guy off, and you don't want to tell I mean, it's just like, man, you start mass marketing yourself that way, and uh, pretty, soon, er, pretty soon every song is no rain, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. no kidding. Uh, from, the, um, from the hits of the 90s. For 20 years, this song's gonna haunt me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah can you ever see a day that uh, you won't be playing that song live? You know what? Actually, we just started playing it live, and I think that now it's a lot more comfortable. We last time we had played it was Woodstock, and the other night was the first time we played it since mm -hmm. then. And um, I think we just had to let it rest for a while. Now, now that you play it in the middle of like a bunch of other new songs, it's a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, but you know. Uh, that when being you... requested out of every radio station we went to, you know, when we do acoustic shows and stuff, it's like, that was the only thing that a lot of people wanted to hear, so we just started playing it first off, All right. you know, to get rid of the people who just came to hear that. Yeah, I saw the Rembrandts a couple of weeks ago, and then they got the big problem of having that Friends song. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, so they were playing it in the middle of the set and uh, just getting it over with, and I, I think maybe playing it first isn't a bad idea, get it, get it over with. The Indigo Girls used to do that, too, with that Closer to Fine video. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That, you know, listen to me. See, I'm such I'm so corrupted by this video age. Like about that closer to find video. I, instead of saying song, I said video. It's uh -huh. horrible. <laughs> Yeah, and the uh, lazy way of thinking, I think. Uh, and boy, I hate to ask this, but I know that people are going to ask me: the, the B girl is she? Uh, is that the end of her career? She had her fifteen minutes I, of fame. I don't know, I, but you know what? I know that that girl is going to hate her parents one day. Uh -huh. Why did you? Why did you let me do this? <laughs> Doing the video was okay, but then she like went out on her own like little B girl press tour, mm -hmm. yeah. and it was really. It was funny, man. She was she was annoying as all oh, get out. <laughs> and her parents were even like twice as annoying. And and I think that if I wouldn't have been off the record enhanced by yeah. acid, I, I probably would have, been, would have fucking thrown her to the cows, man. That yeah. girl is just like she just wouldn't shut up. Mm. Well, not not that I leave too many gaps between words. But, <laughs> I mean, this girl made me look like a mime. Well, the, the, that was the whole thing about the. Uh, about the early successes, I looked at that and went, and, and then I listened to the record and go, this isn't what this band is about at all. And, and you know, people have just gotten the wrong, you know, they, they think you're the spin doctors or something. Well, I, and, and they got this whole hippie thing. Right. You know, right. and I'm like thinking, okay, well, well, I guess, you know, we didn't do too much to just 
you know, have dissuaded anybody as far as like the way our appearance may have looked in the video or like some of the people we hung out with. Well, you know who I just heard was really sick, which really bothers me, is, is Timothy Leary. We just did the video galaxy with him. Uh -huh. He's in the video with us. And, uh, and just found out he's um, got prostate cancer. Oh, jeez. Oh, yeah, isn't that sad? Yeah. That guy was a real, I mean, man, what a, what a... Little boy in a very, I mean, he was, so, he seemed, he could relate to you no matter how. I watched him talking with this young little boy who's in the video, who plays the elf in the video. Mm -hmm. Or the little, yeah. his apprentice, what, you know, the wizard's apprentice, whatever. Um, he's like, he was just like a 10 or, 15, 10 or 12 year old kid. And I was just watching how Timothy Leary would interact with him. And he was just such a kid himself and so young at heart, you know. And, but you can imagine the revisionist history that's going to go on when he dies. Oh, you know? gosh. It's just going to be ridiculous. Yeah. But um, uh, just a couple of quick things. When did you, you graduate from McCutcheon? In, in uh, 85. 85. And so... We got uh, beat by Franklin Central in 80, 83 in the high school state final game. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> and I was pinned, or I was beat seventeen to three by David Bridgeforth from Warren Central in my nineteen eighty four semi state wrestling tournament. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that's at Franklin Central High School's gym, which was the worst because they had just previously whipped our ass in football. Uh -huh. I was such a jock. <laughs> that's just so hard to imagine. I don't know why. <laughs> But it's really kind of cool, you know. And now you you got a, a whole different life and a whole different career, but uh, but very funny. Um, and uh, so you, so you're about 28. Uh, I turned 28 this month. 28 this month. Okay. Yep. So uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. And um, anything else you want me to tell people? Uh, you know what? Um, just tell Bob and Tom that I said hello and <laughs> hope they're doing well. Yeah. Because <laughs> I really, I really um, care for them. Here, here's, here's what I was thinking, which really kind of made me angry. This was the only thing that made me angry. What if there, what if by chance I would have had, if we would have had difficulties with the pregnancy? Mm -hmm. What if there would have been something wrong with our child? I think those are things that they should really think about before they, start. that's why I'm saying I don't care. I put my own head on the chopping block. You don't have to try to shove it down there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I shove, unfortunately, all five of my feet in my mouth. And, and I, and I, but I'm aware of this, so I have no problem when I'm attacked uh, in, in any type of uh, manner at all. I'm used to it. I, I, I'm, I'm above being thoroughly affected by it. But when you start to talk about things like that, and here, I, before we even had a child, one thing um, that, like, you know, I look at capital punishment, and I, and I cannot say that people who commit crimes against kids, such as murder, are not. I, that is the one thing that I deem where capital punishment is appropriate. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that anybody who has the the uh, the gut to kill a child has the the guts to offer anything to society. Uh, and, and that is the only thing, like, like I believe in Amnesty International, but that's the big hang-up is the death penalty. I believe that 90% uh, that of what they're about is so morally correct, and I believe it's appropriate in third world countries where people kill people for their political beliefs. But in America, I think that our judicial system has kind of got a little bit more grip than, you know, South America. South American, you know, uh, cities that we were that we visited, where people would, you know, walk around with fucking machine guns in the streets or in malls and things, and and I, but I was just thinking, I was like, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can, I can, I can stomach a lot of things, but when you start attacking children in any manner, I don't care what it is, that's something that I feel like is so inappropriate, you know. I mean, you know, don't condemn my child because she's my child. You know, I, I wanted to ask you, coming back to music for one quick second, is this this record, um, and and one of the things that uh, that the person who wrote the review for us criticized was was your singing, and I think your singing is so much more interesting on this that, that um, I'm getting a lot more from your voice. I mean, I'm getting like a real wide range of of sounds and such, and I'm wondering if that's uh, just me as a listener, if you're consciously doing that. You know what? I think after. The first tour, to be honest with you, I I tore my vocal cords to pieces, uh -huh. and I think that you know, and I'm I was never in, I mean I always would go and, and consult like a doctor to make sure that I wasn't getting the throat nodules, mm -hmm. 
And when I found out that I wasn't, I was like, well, God, it sure feels like I do it. And I've always been a fan of the raspy singer. I always loved that about Janis Joplin. And I think that that a lot of people, it's either, uh, a, it's a love-hate thing. You either like it or you don't. And um, and I think that on this record, I think that um, because I was more apt to finding the conviction of, of believing what I was singing about and the, and the conviction of, of, of executing it, I think I really didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the to the singing proper way, which is what I wanted, which is what I love to do. I don't, I don't want to be perfect. I don't want to sing every line perfectly uh, pitch wise or whatever. I mean, I'm not, I'm looking more for, for the feeling of satisfaction. And I feel like if you have that, then, it, then whatever it sounds like is, is about as authentic as, it, uh, authentic as it can get. As far as if you're trying to really capture, um, uh, the, the meaning of what you're saying or what you're singing. And, and I think that, um, and I think that, uh, you know, I finally got my throat to the, the worn out, um, uh, damaged way that I've always wanted it to be. To be honest, with you. I mean, I have, I, I have more comfortable. I'm more comfortable now with the way I sing than I ever. Ha- you know, I don't feel insecure about it anymore. I don't feel like I'm like I'm trying to sing something that I can't sing. And and, and whereas, you know, I mean. I can listen to the first record and I can hear the insecure person that I was, you know, before I was sure that I wanted to do that. You know, when we made the first record, we were like, wow, you know, we have a career. Mm-hmm. And, and none of us wanted a career <laughs> at anything. So now all of a sudden I have to go, well, shit, now we got to go out and follow this thing that, you know, I mean, everybody in the band's into different things, like even other than music. So it's like now we have this engulfing all of our time. It was like, you know, I mean, all right, well, I'm going to have to get comfortable with doing this. So I think over the course of time, I've developed the, the, the voice that I have now, which which I feel on the record is, is a, if, if you're if you're looking for someone with perfect pitch and um, um, perfect execution, then I'm not your guy. <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. And, um, but I, you know, it's it's someone's opinion, and, and they have a right to it, and, and you know, there's there's. Uh, I, mean, I was just thinking of range. I mean, like I, I, you know, the first one I thought, the first record I thought, well, you know, this this is very Perry Farrell like. It sounds like that. But then, I mean, you listen to this, and there's there is a song um, that reminds me of John Anderson of Yes, and there's a song that <laughs> this is weird, but it, it reminds me of Jose Feliciano. I mean, you know, so it's sort of all. I mean, it, so you you hit the smooth stuff and you hit the rough stuff, and it was just I thought it was a much more interesting range of, of stuff so Thanks. that's uh, um, anyway well this is great and uh, you've been uh, more than kind with your time and uh, I'll hey you know what it's, it's good conversations are uh, I mean they, they they take the interview out of the interview yeah you know? yeah I mean and plus plus you know what the kid thing you could I could talk to you all day <laughs> yeah I could do the same it's weird how you. like I feel when you look into a kid's eye, the your child's eyes how you you feel like the the baby, mm-hmm. and they they take on the appearance of like an old human being that's a million years old yeah. who's come back to see how you're doing. Well, the the, the thing that uh, your child will do would just be it's just amazing, you know, the things that all that'll happen all of a sudden. I mean, when they start doing, when she starts to crawl, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, one day I went out for a little while. I came back. And my wife said, "Look at this," and my daughter was crawling up the steps, which I just thought, "Oh my God, this is the end of the world." <laughs> Gonna, I'm quitting my job. We are dead. I mean, she is going to come down the, the stairs and uh, you know just fall down the stairs, and then you, so you spend your life worrying about stuff like that. But oh, you know, but when she, Don't tell me that. yeah, but when she when she starts talking to you and when she starts walking around and uh, uh, how old are you? Uh, I am 36. And you have two children. Yeah, and wow, well, one one you. and one on the way. So. Man, that's incredible. Yeah. You know the the uh, the calm demeanor is something that uh, my child didn't inherit. <laughs> yeah, but this part, I mean, you just, you, you'll see things that just, I mean, I look at my daughter sometimes and I think, man, she just looks, I, I see me in her, and, and which scares the shit out of me, because my wife is a hell of a lot better looking than I am, so uh, you don't want to see that, and then, um, and, you know, but, but you see things that she does, and she picks up things that you do and say, and you just go, oh my God, why is she picking up those things, you know, why can't she pick up my good habits? <laughs> 
Lisa, Lisa, Nika looks like like Lisa, um, and then when she gets mad, she looks like me. (laughs) The expression on her face and her eyes and everything change into me, and it's really horrible. Oh yeah, that's the same. That's the same thing that I experience too. I just think, man, she gets mad, and that is just that's me right there, the little little body and a little thirty pounder going uh, going nuts and being stubborn as shit. so that's that's my traits. So, well, anyway, Mark, yeah. it was a pleasure talking to you, sir. Same here. And, and um, and if uh, if uh, if you can come up to the show over there. Oh, I'll be there. And, All right. Uh, well, come up and weeks. come up and, uh, and grab me by the elbow. Okay. All right. Take care. See ya. Right. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tapes Archive podcast. Please remember, you can always find more information about the show and the individual episodes at our website, thetapesarchive.com. Until next time, the vault is closed. <laughs>